Welcome to the Happiness Matters podcast, where we'll explore happiness at work and show you how to coach yourself to be happier there and more successful too, no matter what. Welcome everyone, I'm Julia Seal and this is the Happiness Matters podcast, where we learn and practice everything about happiness and success how to evolve ourselves, how to self-coach, how to live into the best versions of ourselves. We're currently looking at the science of your happiness, how the world's academics are choosing to define happiness. And we've had a look at two versions already, and now we're on to the third. We're looking at something called whole being. We're drawing to the end of our Series 1 coaching overall, the defining, assessing and visioning your happiness and success. So we're ending off with these episodes to ensure that we've created robust and meaningful definitions of happiness and success no matter what for ourselves. So no running on hedonic treadmills or chasing rainbows or searching for four-leaf clovers. (laughs) Although in the COVID lockdown, with so many of us worldwide confined to our homes, even this kind of exercise seems attractive. I don't know what you're doing, but to keep my dogs Yeti and Lupin and myself sane, I've created a short obstacle course through the garden, running laps around the vegetable patch and skipping in the driveway, staring longingly at the world outside. (laughs) This has now even turned into an Olympic challenge with Fraser's family also living in lockdown in London and Scotland. So how are all of you doing this week? I trust by now you've all had a chance to listen to my recent episode 1.35, COVID-19 Keep Calm and Coach Yourself, and that you're putting into practice some of my ideas on how you can coach yourself through the pandemic. If you do have questions, send them to me on Ask Julia on our website, happiness-matters.coach. And remember, please share the COVID episode to as many of your friends, family and colleagues so that coaching can reach as many people as possible over this time. I am still offering free coaching over this COVID-19 time. The nature of our individual journeys through this uncertainty is unpredictable. So if you are one of those who started off well, you might be feeling less resilient and more anxious as time ticks by and the death count keeps rising. And if you started off feeling so fearful, you might have moved on to numbing yourself with buffering, overeating, overdrinking, overworking or overwatching Netflix. Please book these free sessions by visiting the website happiness-matters.coach and clicking on the yellow button, Coach with Julia. Of course, I am still coaching my long-term clients over this period, so if this appeals to you, you can book an initial insight session where we can explore what's going on for you now and how I can help you. Are your relationships under strain? Are the effects of menopause really getting to you now that you're less able to distract yourself with work and commitments? Are you rethinking the purpose of your working life and how to re-enter the busyness after this current downtime? I would love to work with as many of you as I can at this time, so jump on a call with me and let's see how we can do this. Now this week, the next body of work we're going to outline is that of Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar, his concept of whole being happiness and his SPIRE model. And I say I'm outlining it because just like last week's dip into the Greater Good Science Center's version of the science of a meaningful life, this is a vast exploration of the evidence-based research into happiness. And again, I'm highlighting a few elements from within this particular model, ones that I believe will help us all navigate this time of changing businesses, social distancing and working from home. Tal Ben-Shahar is quite a character in the field of happiness studies worldwide. 
For 30 years, he's been focused on establishing an interdisciplinary academic approach of happiness, encompassing biology, philosophy, neuroscience, economics, theology, literature, philosophy, music, and psychology, and probably more. (laughs) As he says, my purpose in life is to bring happiness to life, creating a bridge between the ivory tower and main street, translating the rigorous research conducted in universities into accessible material that individuals and organizations can use. Currently, he's the co-founder and chief learning officer at the Happiness Studies Academy, where I studied with him in the year-long Happiness Studies Certificate. Then, he's also the co-founder of Potential Life, a leadership development program using science to help organizations develop ideal leadership behaviors and bring positive psychology into daily life in a large scale. Then, Mative, that's focused on scientifically validated curricula for educational institutions. And also Happier TV, that aims to provide fun, accessible and scientifically based video content for us to flourish. If you haven't come across Tal's work in these fields yet, you might remember him from the extensive press coverage in 2006 when his course, Positive Psychology, entered the record books as the most popular course in the history of Harvard University. And interestingly, happiness studies is still attracting huge numbers at the world's universities. In 2018, Psychology and the Good Life was Yale University's most popular course. In 2020, their online Science of Wellbeing has 300,000 people already enrolled, similar to that of the 500,000 students studying through the University of Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center that we spoke about last week. Today's approach defines happiness as the experience of whole person well-being of whole being. And the names inspired by Helen Keller, who's famous for learning to speak and read, despite being both deaf and blind, where she said, the only definition of happiness is wholeness. And the model for whole being is the SPIRE framework. So S, spiritual whole being, P, physical whole being, I, intellectual whole being, R, relational whole being, and E, emotional whole being. So again you'll see the happiness is not defined as simply the emotional state of feeling happy or a constant state of ecstasy or gratification. It's a deeper state, more lasting, more meaningful. It's flourishing. As an acronym, SPIRE for the five dimensions of happiness is a useful memory aid. If you think of SPIRE as the highest point of a summit, to fulfill our potential to becoming our highest self to deep and lasting happiness. In episode 1.3, Where Do You Want to Be?, I compared the spire model to a rainbow, where a rainbow is white light refracted in raindrops and reflected back to us as various colors. White light is broken up into red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Each of these are beautiful in their own right and essential to the whole, to white light. So if you think of happiness as white light, the most beautiful, which we can't actually see, but it's made up of spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional whole being, each of them valuable on their own, each of them essential to the whole. Now within this whole being framework, this formula for happiness, there are 12 core principles that when combined into a matrix with the 11 disciplines of knowledge, such as economics, chemistry, film, or philosophy, make up the definition of happiness. Can you see what I mean when I say (laughs) this is such deep and meaningful knowledge? I will run through the 12 principles for you here, but then we're going to put this aside and look down one of these Alice in Wonderland rabbit holes of knowledge to find some useful insights to help us with our self-coaching today. Certainly now, we can be looking at our lives as a whole against the SPIRE model overall, 
to ask ourselves how balanced we are across these dimensions of our lives. Are we creating happiness for ourselves by nurturing each of these areas? Or do we have gaps that are already obvious to us in our spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational and emotional whole being? If we look at the 12 principles that define whole being happiness, you might find some secrets here. At an overarching level, we have the aim of life is and ought to be the pursuit of whole being, well-being. And everything is interconnected. Spiritually, the principles of a purposeful life is a spiritual life. And the ordinary is elevated to the extraordinary through mindful presence. Then physically, mind and body are connected. And a healthy life requires adherence to our given nature. Intellectual, curiosity and openness help us make the most of what life has to offer. And engaging in deep learning fulfills our potential as rational animals. Relational, relationships are crucial for a full and fulfilling life. And the foundation of healthy relationships with others is a healthy relationship with oneself. Emotional. All our emotions are legitimate, acceptable and part of being human. And emotions are the outcome of our thoughts and deeds and inform our thoughts and deeds. These 12 principles are a great way for us to be considering our lives to see how well we've got these covered already. Maybe something has flagged for you already. How robust is our whole being? The first area I thought we could dive into today to further the application of the science of happiness in our own lives and to help us with our self-coaching is our physical whole being, particularly during this time of lockdown, but also because today is World Health Day. World Health Day is a global health awareness day led by the World Health Organization. Now the WHO really is front and center of our lives these days as one of the primary sources of information through the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been around since 1950 and its main aim is to promote, as part of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, worldwide universal health coverage by 2030. You'll remember from our sessions in March, as March is Happiness Month, that the UN Sustainable Development Goals include good health, happiness and well-being for all. Now, even before COVID-19 appeared in China in December, this year's focus area was designated to nurses. And who better for us to be celebrating during these times? All around the world, people are showing up at their doors at designated times to clap and celebrate our healthcare workers. Our little neighborhood comes out at 8 p.m. every night, just before the kids go to bed, to beat our djembe drums and blow the famous South African vuvuzela under the stars. All of us thinking about those who are putting their lives on the line to show up for us. Who would ever have foreseen a more powerful World Health Day? I have put some links into the show notes for you, so you can find out more about universal health coverage for everyone, everywhere by 2030. And you can get updated on where your country is and what your government's plan is for 2030. WHO estimates that the world still needs 18 million more health workers to achieve and sustain universal health coverage. And we can clearly see how under-resourced we are with the pandemic taking hold. I thought for our coaching today, it would be useful to look at what we can learn from the spire view of happiness about the connection between our minds and bodies. What we're discovering in this area and backed up with credible research is that our thoughts, how we see the world and how we are in the world are intimately linked and we can fulfill our potential, our happiness, by recognizing that our mind and body are connected. And I think many of us are aware of the mind-body distinction, the dualistic mindset, and the holistic mindset. Now, those of us brought up in the Western cultures have been heavily influenced by the dualistic mindset, which sees the mind and body as separate, 
two distinct entities, split, divided, and unconnected. That mental phenomena are non-physical. This view was first clearly articulated in the early 1600s by French philosopher, mathematician, and scientist René Descartes. And Cartesian dualism thinking, the dualistic mindset, took root, shaping so much of our Western culture, including our healthcare systems. Medical doctors work separately from psychologists. Traditional, pure psychology pays no attention to the physical body and its impact on our mental health and happiness. But nowadays there's increasing interest and research on the holistic mindset, what the connection between mind and body actually is, and specifically around the hypothesis that what we think and believe will affect our physical ability. So how can we use this today in our self-coaching? So if our thoughts and how we see the world and how we are in the world are intimately linked and we can fulfill our potential by recognizing that our mind and body are connected, how can we use this to be happier and more successful in our lives at work, through menopause and into midlife? One of the funniest pieces of research I've come across to illustrate this is the work done at the Cleveland Clinic, and it involves exercising the little finger. (laughs) One study group imagined they were wiggling their little finger, doing mental contractions. Another group did the same, using their imagination to do contractions of their biceps. And then another group actually did the physical contractions of exercising the finger. They all did their exercises for the same amount of time, for 12 weeks, mentally or physically. The result? It's hilarious. (laughs) The actual exercises increased their finger strength by 53%. The mental exercises, the ones imagining the exercise, also increased their strength. The visualized finger lifters by 35% and the bicep visualizers by 13.5%, all without moving. (laughs) So for fun in lockdown, you could strengthen your muscles by visualizing it. But the greatest story to illustrate this is that of the dream mile, the four-minute mile. Back in the 1950s, running a mile in four minutes or less was believed to be impossible, beyond the limits of human physical ability, until Roger Bannister, a medical student from Oxford, found the key. And in 1954, he broke this record, running the mile in three minutes and 59 seconds. And now the world record stands at 3 minutes and 43 seconds. His training was not more physical training. He believed the key was his mind and that the impenetrable barrier was not the physical limitation of the human body, but the mind, the belief that it could not be done. And he used visualization to challenge his entrenched beliefs. And since this year's Olympics in Tokyo have been postponed until July 2021, a lot of the world's athletes are going to use visualization to break their current limits and do even better at next year's games. So knowing this, approaching our lives, our problems, and using our mind and bodies together, how can you use this tool? the tool of successful athletes. How can you use visualization today while we're in lockdown? If you've been listening from the early days of the Happiness Matters podcast, you'll remember visualization from episode 1.3 and 1.3 Q&A. And here we learned about brainstorming and vision boarding. There's also a free coaching tool to go with this episode where I go step by step how to use visualization in your self-coaching. I think in that episode, it's also the one where I sing, (laughs) which is pretty awful. (laughs) Please listen back to these episodes and download the tool from our website, happiness-matters.coach under the fun and free section and see how you could apply visualization to your current happiness barriers, how combining your mind and body, applying the holistic mindset and using visualization to your current problem can help you break through physically. Perhaps you're battling with what might become your new normal, 
remote working or running a challenging team or underperformers or looming job cuts or job sharing. Perhaps this is the perfect opportunity to do your midlife review. Or how can the drudge and loneliness of social isolation in 2020 become playful? You could exploit the mind-body connection every morning, imagining yourself as you want to be, how you want to show up in this pandemic world and afterwards. The next area I've chosen for us to dive into today to help us with our self-coaching is our intellectual whole being. I thought what would help us the most today and link to last week's discussion about how cooperation has such an important part to play in our happiness is the spire view of happiness about how curiosity and openness help us make the most of what life has to offer. And my choice is inspired by this week's International Day of Human Space Flight, an annual celebration of the anniversary of the first human space flight by Yuri Gagarin in 1961, 59 years ago. Every night at 8pm while we're standing outside blowing our vuvuzelas with the neighbours, I'm looking up at the stars. And we have very clear stars here, as the city lights are hidden by the back of the Table Mountain range. So standing out, looking at the stars, thinking about us all united by COVID-19, and also thinking about my darling father, who died five years ago on the same day, and how he loved the stars, and taught me to talk to the moon, and was hugely curious about the world. Something that connects him and me to Thomas. Curiosity, humankind's insatiable curiosity, got us into space and onto the moon, and it will get us to a solution for COVID-19 that will change the way that we address global healthcare and future pandemics. What's exciting now, though, is that it's not quite like the space race, the Soviet Union against the United States during the Cold War. It's more like the international cooperation to keep a multinational permanent presence in outer space aboard the International Space Station. We're now in a time of global curiosity and working together, learning from each other. We are having as a world to cooperate like never before and to be open to unexpected answers. We're having to be globally curious. So how do we mirror this openness and curiosity? How do we leverage curiosity to increase our happiness and success? A curious mindset is essential. In coaching, it keeps you open to new possibilities. And in today's world, it'll keep us positive and looking for ways to thrive. And of course, in business, innovation is going to be needed now more than ever. So how do we do it? How do we coach ourselves to become curious so that we can be curious about our own self-growth and evolution? Curious about how we can use visualization to thrive, how we can cooperate more, and how we can increase our pro-social behaviors? Well, we do it by developing beginner's mind. This is a concept from Buddhism that refers to having an attitude of openness, eagerness, and lack of preconceptions when studying a subject, even when studying at an advanced level, just as a beginner would. According to Zen master Shunru Suzuki, in the beginner's state of mind there are many possibilities, but in the experts there are few. Now don't go wrong here. It is wonderful to have the skill of an expert, but it's about our attitude, our mindset, an expert's mindset or a beginner's mindset and how it relates to our happiness. So the beginner's mind is about dropping our expectations and our preconceived ideas about something and seeing things with an open mind, fresh eyes, just like a beginner. We become judgment-free, open, curious, available and present, like the world scientists are right now. As they develop a vaccine, they're applying beginner's mind, collecting raw data, observing without bias. One of the ways to cultivate the beginner's mind and to grow our capacity for curiosity and openness is meditation and mindfulness practices. 
If that's not something you've tried yet, you can get started with my coaching tool, Three Long Strong Breaths, available on the website, happiness-matters.coach, under the fun and free section. And then for those of us in isolation and probably noticing our days are getting quite repetitive, you can use this idea. Treat every day like it's your birthday. (laughs) You know what that's like. When you wake up on your birthday, every moment is heightened and special. This is what mindfulness is all about. Every task we do becomes interesting and even fun. Pick an activity, any activity that you're doing every day, brushing your teeth, logging onto the company email server, standing in a shopping queue, creating yet another presentation. Start by seeing the activity with fresh eyes, as if you don't know what to expect and as if you've never done it before. Use all your senses to engage with the activity. What are you seeing? Things you'd usually not notice, tastes, smells, how your breathing feels while you're doing it. Take nothing for granted. Have any of you watched Undercover Boss? This is a great example of using beginner's mind as a tool to improve the functioning of an organization. The boss looks at his business from a whole new perspective. I'd go and have a look at it if you haven't watched it already. Or think about the guy in France who started the trend of running a marathon on a tiny balcony during his isolation. I've no idea if he did it mindlessly, tuned out and just moving his legs backwards and forwards, or if he did it mindfully, noticing every nuance in his body and his breath, noticing the play of light on his balcony, noticing the birds and the dust motes and the clouds. But what we do know from the science of happiness and from the whole being formula of Spire, that if he approached his marathon, or if you approach your small task with beginner's mind, you are actively increasing your happiness in a long-term sustainable way. You are increasing your capacity to be happy and successful no matter what. Thanks, everyone. We've come to the end of our overview of the SPIRE formula in the science of happiness. I hope you enjoyed it and find it useful. These two deep dives into visualization and curiosity and their essential role in your happiness and success. As a final reminder, you'll find all the past podcasts, show notes and coaching tools on happiness-matters.coach. And please remember again to share this Happiness Matters podcast with your friends, family and colleagues who might be interested in learning how to coach themselves every day to be happier. Next week, we're going to start our exploration into the science of happiness at work. And I've got yet another acronym for you to add to your definition of happiness. This one's called PERK. May you be happy. May you be free. And there is no better time to do this coaching together. Bye for now. The evening star Venus is out already. I'm thinking of you all and wishing you a very safe and healthy World Health Day. Thanks for joining us on this Happiness Matters podcast. Do join us again here next week on Tuesday. You can subscribe to this series at Apple Podcasts on iTunes, or you can sign up for it on our website, happinessmatters.coach. That's happiness-matters.coach. C-O-A-C-H. Also, you can join our conversation on Facebook by following us there. Our Facebook page is also happiness-matters.coach. Thank you.